Good morning, everybody. Hope you're all well and doing good. Um, we've got enough volume there. I feel like I'm not too... Can I have a little bit for me in the room? I'd just, I'd just like to be able to hear me. Thank you very much. I've, I've just been a nuisance. Good morning, everybody at Hope House Church and visitors and friends. So good to be with you. We love you to bits. You are amazing. Um, this morning, I'm going to continue... Um, uh, with our reset series, a little picture down here, our reset, you know, like on a computer where you reset it. Uh, if you can't make it work, turn it off and back on again. In a sense, what we're doing with our lives over this period of time and looking to the future is turning our lives off and back on again, back to God's factory settings. That's where we want to be, back to God's factory settings. It's like updating an app. Uh, you know, we get the latest thing and suddenly you get the new version of the app and everything's changed, but everything is so much smoother. Everything is so much better. We want to be in that place with God this morning because we've got a world that is talking about roadmaps, a world that is talking about dates and data and choices. And, you know, we want to get this stuff right in God, but what we want to get most right in God is our relationship with him. And so we want to reset everything as we begin to look forward, not just um, looking back at this past, not just surviving in the moment, but actually knowing his presence in this moment is what we're going to be about. So last week I spoke about the theme of resetting our life relationships, and this is the next part of that, resetting life relationships. One of the things I said was, being still before God isn't a discipline to master, but a relationship to enter. And, and that's a very core part of what I'm going to talk about today. And isn't it easy to say? Isn't it easy to say that? It's all about the relationship. Relationships are so easy. And relationships are just a breeze. Anybody can do relationships. It's so simple. If only that were true. You know, I, I realized, though, even as I wrote this down, that we all do have relationships. We all have relationships, and we all have relationships with other people all of the time. We never don't have relationships. And so I started to think about what those relationships might be. And I thought, well, I, I have, um, and many of you will have Facebook groups. So I'm in groups of people. And in a strange way, digitally, I can share a part of my life with them and I can place some trust in those groups of, that are based around hobbies or interests or looking for help. And just this morning we were talking about some of the help I've received, some technical help from a group of friends online. Actually, but I only share a portion or a perspective or you know, a, a, an element of my life with them that I want them to know about, that I want to share with them. Other people, of course, share much of their life with, I don't know, a therapist or a counsellor. Or you might share a relationship with a colleague. When I say share a relationship with a colleague, I don't mean like that. I mean like we share desks. Okay? If, that, if that's you, then repent now and receive from the Lord his blessing and, and forgiveness. Um, so we might have a relationship with a colleague at work. Um, you might have a, a, a regular bus driver that you get to know. Uh, you might have a people next door that you, you share an element of relationship with. And they can be good things or they can be terrible things. But they are relationships. They are managed and they are temporary. What we need is something bigger than that. Because what we've got at the moment is a kind of uh, Tinder lifestyle. You know where people are looking for the debt and they scroll left until they find one that they like. You just keep scrolling through relationships and possibilities. We need something more substantial in our lives than a kind of tinder spirituality. No one can ever say they have no relationships. No one watching this this morning can say they have no relationships. The very least you've got is a relationship with the people that supply your gas and electric. It may not be a great one, but it is a relationship. And it's the beginning of something. We all have relationships, but it is the quality of relationship that we long for. It's the quality of relationship. You know, relationships are easy. Quality relationships are a whole different thing. And this is interesting because it shows us an eternal truth about ourselves, an eternal truth about the nature of our relationship with God. And that's what I want to expand on. So I want to take us from our very first verse um, right back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. So it's right back at the very beginning of the Bible, just after creation. It says this, Then God said, Let us make man in our image like our likeness. So this is God who wants to begin a relationship with mankind, with human beings, and he makes them to function, to think, and to be like him. To, you know, they have the same passions and, and creativity, uh, the same cares, that is us at our best. So we began 
in relationship with God. He wanted to walk with us. We began in relationship with God. But let, let me jump you to the New Testament, more recent writings, to a, a letter written to a church in uh, called Col uh, the Colossian Church, um, it, which I think is in like the Greek world, Turkey kind of place, as, as it would be now. And this is what it says. Now you've dressed in a new wardrobe. Every item of your new way of life is custom made by the by the God, by God with His label on it. All the old fashions are, are now obsolete. Words like Jewish and non-Jewish, religious, irreligious, insider and outsider, uncivilized and uncouth, slave and free—they mean nothing. From now on, everyone is defined by Christ. Everyone is included in Christ. So chosen by God for this new life of love, dress in the wardrobe God picked out for you. Compassion, kindness, humility, quiet strength, discipline, be even tempered, content with second place, quick to forgive an offense. Forgive as quickly and completely as the master forgave you and regardless of what else you put on, wear love. It's your basic all-purpose garment. Never be without it. So in that, in Christ, we are defined by relationship. So we began in relationship, and we are defined by relationship in God. It changes everything about us when we meet Jesus. How amazing is that? So putting on that disciple lifestyle isn't a discipline to master, but a relationship to enter. And 1 John, a letter, um, again, written, it's in the New Testament, and it's written by a guy called John, it says this, we love because he first loved us us we find purpose in relationship we're able to love we have something to do to love because jesus first loved us so we find purpose in relationships so there's a whole journey in jesus to be had so that's great that's all i want to say for today that's it i've done that sums up everything however because i'm a preacher i'm going to go on a little bit longer um so let's think how we can reset our lives ready for tomorrow and ready for the next day and ready for this next season that approaches because i know already people are saying uh, I, I didn't like being in lockdown i don't like being in lockdown i don't want to unlock i don't like unlocking i just don't like everything's anxious everything is and i get that i'm not criticizing that i'm just empathizing with you and saying in jesus in Jesus, we have more. So my number one point this morning, number one, the first thing I want to say, we begin in relationship with Jesus. It should be popping up down here, I think. We begin in relationship with Jesus. I love a TV program called Long Lost Families. I, I, I just love it. Um, it's about people who were adopted out and then they, they just need to know where they came from, who was my mother, where, where, who was my father, where, how did this happen, who was my DNA, and they do all these searches, and they, they find for the first time their birth mothers and their brothers and siblings, and I just love this sense of they need to connect with their actual DNA, and it can be stronger than their nurture experience, they love their parents, they have raised them, but they need their DNA connection, they need to know who they are and what they're about, and it's a fascinating show, and I just love that. You know, so often what I, what, what's interesting is that these lives that were separated at birth, you discover that they've got similar looks to their parents or the siblings that they've never met. They've got similar interests that, with the, their birth family that they've never met. They've had similar experiences and similar jobs. And I find it fascinating that there is something DNA-wise within them that still connects them to that birth family so amazing to me, especially when it finishes so positively that it, that it always does on this show. And it tells me that there is something within us. We were created in God's image. No matter how far we are from him, no matter how broken we may be, no matter how distant, there is something within us calling that says, this is my real DNA. This is who I'm meant to be. I'm meant to belong in Christ. See, there are patterns in our lives, traits that we inherit from our family. It's in our DNA. And when God created people, he put something of himself in us. So our natural inclination, as much as we resist, is the need for the spiritual. And we fill it with all sorts of spiritual. Fill it with all sorts of interests and hobbies. But our core, true, eternal need is to be in relationship with God the Father through Jesus. You know, these life patterns can be positive or negative that we build up. We all have patterns in our lives, ways of thinking, practices, habits. And it's certainly true of Christians. I read a phrase... Uh, a few weeks ago, and it said this, we have Jesus in our hearts, but we have grandpa in our bones. 
So even when I give my life to Jesus, there's a bit of my human family and the inheritance and the attitudes and the character that still kind of wells up and gets in the way. It's not all good. I'm not perfect the minute to come to Jesus. I am still human, but I'm on a journey. And I'm becoming more like my supernatural DNA parent. I'm becoming more like Jesus. Generations so often repeat the patterns of previous generations. Have you noticed that? Uh, Sons and daughters will often take the jobs that their parents did or have a similar interest or similar connection. They'll be passionate about similar things or completely reject everything, one or the other. But so often there are patterns. And, you know, when we've experienced things in the past, when there are stories that hang over us, they can sometimes be like curses that, that just hang there over our lives. The things that were said. I think I've jokingly told you in the past that my grandmother said to me when I was a little, a little boy, Oh, yeah, yeah, your granddad died at 41. Your dad died at 41. He lad. Oh, I hope you have a good 42nd birthday. <laughs> my 41st birthday was the scariest day of my entire life. It's like you're staying, don't cross the road, don't drink anything hot, don't carry pointy objects. It was just like the scary. I mean, you know what? That is just something that somebody said. We are not cursed that way. I just need to, you know, the noise of the past and those experiences can fill our lives and hold us back, the noise. Psalm 46 verse 10 says this. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. You know, we have to be still so that he can be exalted in our lives and in this earth. Because when we are still and give him space and presence, relationship with him, it overwhelms all of that stuff. It, it overwhelms the things that my grandmother said to me because Jesus is bigger than that kind of human thinking. When we are still, we see that Jesus can literally change the patterns of people's lives. He can change the patterns of our community. We are no longer formed by our past, but by our Jesus presence. Church, you don't have to be formed by your past. If you're looking in, if you're a visitor or you're just wrestling with this stuff, whatever has gone off in the past, you do not have to be formed by that past, but by the presence of Jesus. 1 John chapter 4, it says it all. We love because he first loved us. You know, you're the person that thinks that you're unlovely, that nobody wants you. Well, get this. He first loved us. Jesus' love isn't a sentimental thought but a physical and spiritual action of purpose in our lives, your life and my life. It's got purpose. It's not just wet and sentimental. It changes eternity. It changes your present experience. Colossians chapter 3, uh, writing to another church again. From now on, everyone is defined by Christ. Everyone is included in Christ. When you become a believer in Jesus, you, your new life is defined by him your relationship with him. In fact, if you don't choose to, to put your life in, in, in his, if you don't choose to believe in him, to follow him, you are still defined by your option away from Jesus. I want to be defined by my option for Jesus. His love defines us and it includes us. It has a quality of relationship. He loved us first. I want to be defined by his love in my life. The emphasis is upon, is upon his active love not your loveliness. Isn't it a relief to know that Jesus loves you when you're unlovely? It's not a, hey, they're good looking, I love them. Hey, they're useful, I love them. Look at the skills they've got, I love them. Wow, look at the car they drive, I love them. Ooh, look at the house they live in, I love them. Nah, none of that, none of that. It just says, I love you, regardless. You could be the most unlovely person in the world with the worst history and past experiences. Jesus just loves you. That capacity to love and create quality relationships now lives in every one of us who believes. That is our God potential. We love because he first loved us. It's that love he pours unconditionally into us. We're able to pour unconditionally into others. Wow, what a gift. What a gift you have this morning looking into this. What a gift we have to carry that degree of love 
through us to channel that. Galatians chapter 2, another letter to the church. Hey, God speaks a lot to his people. And the Bible is full of these letters flying about, people sharing and encouraging. This is another one of those things. Galatians chapter 2. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. How good is that? See, whatever your past was, we now live in Christ. We don't live in the past. We don't live in the experiences. We live now in Jesus. That is the transformation that he wants to bring into your setting and situation. I don't care if you've been a Christian for 50 years or more, or for five minutes, or you're just about to make a commitment. That same truth is there. He can change everything when we surrender to him. So here's what I'd like you to think about doing just for a few seconds right now. You can name the patterns of your life that cause pain and loss. Right now, you can begin again the process of letting them go. Right now, you can begin to live in Jesus' presence in faith. Just this moment, just try it this moment, just for a moment. So I'm just going to ask you to do, if you're that person that has history, that has past, that has experiences that, that are painful, or just you keep looking back to, you know what, just live in this moment in Jesus. Right now, name the patterns that cause you pain and loss. Name them out loud. Pray them through. Just say them to the Lord. Right now, you can begin the process of letting them go. Right now, you can begin to live in Jesus' presence in faith just for this moment. And why am I saying just for this moment? Because tomorrow is going to be really difficult. Listen to what the Bible says. Don't worry about tomorrow. That has enough worries of its own. I love that Scripture is so honest with us. You know, when we come to Jesus, it doesn't say, come to Jesus, life will be perfect. There will be candy hanging from the trees, and your house will ever be warm, and you'll never be short of money, and everybody you meet will be happy and like you. None of that is in Scripture. Tomorrow we'll have worries of its own. I kind of get that. So you know what? Right now, in this moment, in this moment, you and I can be the presence of Jesus, and then we don't need to worry in this moment. And tomorrow, there's a new moment. And on Tuesday, there's a new moment. And on Wednesday, there's a new moment. And every day for eternity, there can be a brand new moment where we do not need to worry. You know, there used to be a really, really icky old song in the 1970s, One Day at a Time, Jesus, Sweet Jesus. No, I'm not going to sing it. For a brief moment, I nearly sang the first line. I'm not going to inflict that upon you. Um, you know what? Not one day at a time, Sweet Jesus. You know, sometimes, some days, Lord, one moment at a time. Just, just this moment. Lord, get me through this moment. Is actually a statement of faith. And that brings me to my next point. Point number two. We are defined by relationship with Jesus. We are defined by relationship with Jesus. Do you ever get fed up of being defined by other people? Oh, my days. This is how you're meant to be. That is how you're meant to be. We're told how we should be. Uh, let, let, let me give you some of, the, some of the definitions that people have about us. Blondes are not clever. Not true. Bald men are attractive. Possibly true. <laughs> IT specialists are nerds. Old people can't use IT. Unemployed people are scroungers. City bankers are not scroungers. Some races are better than others. Some backgrounds are better than others. Money gives you personal value. No money devalues who you are. Educated people are better people. You only have purpose if you have a job. Sun readers don't understand politics. People who don't agree with me are wrong. Actually, that last one is true. They're all definitions, many of them silly, many of them have catastrophic implications for our community. The race stuff, the money stuff, the background and class stuff breaks lives, breaks communities, tells lies. But we are defined by them. The world's noise defines us. But we are being defined by a broken world. I want to be defined by a perfect God, not by a broken world. The only definition of our worth is found in Jesus. I don't care what class you are, what race you are, what money you, you have, what money you don't have, what past hurts you've experienced. The only thing that matters is that you matter to Jesus. 
you matter to our God. Today, if you are a believer, you are defined by Jesus and of infinite worth and have a name that matters and is valuable so that you have a new voice. You have his voice of truth, of reconciliation, of breaking through, of transformation, of defining other people in the light of Jesus' love. 2 Corinthians, another letter. Man alive, the church likes to write letters. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. So put off the old self. You know the stuff that causes pain and anguish, the attitudes that you've had that cause other people pain? Put it off. It's part of the old life. You know, nothing about Jesus brings us pain. Only when we ignore him do we find pain. And even through pain, he can redefine us and bring us to a new place in relationship with him. I have never known a time such as this when we are all badged and told what makes us matter or not matter. And next week, there's going to be a budget. This is not a political statement, it's just a reality. Next week, there's going to be a budget by the Chancellor of the Exchequer, and that will badge people in different ways about what they need and don't need, how important they are or unimportant they are. You know what? In a sense, none of that matters because... Jesus is Lord, he's King of Kings, and you matter to him. The question of how much, sorry, the question of how I must look to have value and to matter, it damages our identity in Christ and breeds anxiety and pain. If we dwell on how other people perceive us, we will be broken, we will be anxious, and we will be in pain. If we dwell on how Jesus sees us, if we are still and we know that he's God, that will build us and lift us and heal us and free us. You know, when we dwell on our people define us, it leads us to weigh the worth of others. And so it creates a vicious cycle. They judge us and we judge them. It's a circle of measuring and comparing of ourselves. And Scripture is very clear when it says, don't judge others or you'll be judged. You know, why don't we do that? Because it's just vicious and breaks us. We become defined by a broken world and we need to be defined by a perfect God. I want to share a bit of heart. I read something recently that a preacher should bring himself uh, and share heart on stage. So I want to share a little bit of truth with you this morning. When I was 13 years old, my dad died. Um, my mum, being my mum, sent me back to school after the weekend that he died. It would be good for me to get back into it. The teacher, without any warning, announced in front of the class... This big statement, top of his voice, Bedford's father is dead, try to be nice to him this week. Wow. The bullying began. The being ostracized began. The shallowness of an old boys' school at that moment in time was unbelievable. It was unbelievable, the shallowness of a boy's school. The lack of care, empathy, connection, <laughs> support. Wow. That was the moment I understood the loss and hardness of the world. I understood my loss and I understood the loss that was in the world. I understood the hardness of the world that we live in, the way we are judged and defined. It's also the same year I became a Christian. I took hold of that and I understood something from that hardness and that experience. It changed me for a time. Because of it, I have to hold everything together now, and I have to face life. It just, it's learned behavior from that experience. That event formed me. It has formed my home life. It has formed my work life. It has formed my leadership at church. It has formed my self-perception. It has formed my personal worth. It has made me feel overly responsible. It has made me afraid of failure. It has made me anxious about conflict. It has forced me to be stable. It has made me empathize with others. It has probably made me into a church pastor. And you will have your experience. You will have your elements of your life that have formed you. Now what we need to do is to let Jesus reform us, recreate us. You know, it has made me have a look at Jesus to make sense of those experiences. And even now, years later, I have to look at Jesus to make sense of those experiences. It left me with a choice. Genesis chapter 15, verse 20, you intended to harm me. This is, this is uh, Jacob. 
uh, Tolkien, you intended to harm Joseph, Joseph Tolkien, you, intended, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. See, when the world, the broken world, wants to harm us, God can let those things happen so that many lives can be saved, so that we can grow through the experience. Romans, another letter from the church. Um, verse 8, 28, chapter 8, 28. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. You see, God used my experience, and because of my experience, I found him. Because I found him, I ended up being a church leader. Without that loss, without that negative experience, you know what, I might have been a different person and never pursued Jesus. So strangely, I'm thankful for the journey he's taken me on. And you can be too. May have been painful, but that's not where he leaves you. He leaves you in his presence going into the future. Even before we know Jesus, he knows us and loves us. This allows him to not only redeem our lives, but to redeem our past for his purpose. I just want to read that to you again. Even before we know Jesus, he knows us and loves us. This allows him to not only redeem our lives, but redeem our past for his purpose. We have value in Christ. This defines our relationship and our and identity in Christ. And it is a display of the value Jesus places on us. True value is found in a life whose faith is looking upward to him. So this morning, in your stillness, look up to him and find value and worth. See yourself differently to where the broken world sees you. Reset your mind. Reset how you see yourself in Christ. We are not defined by our past but by our relationship with Jesus. My third and final brief point, we find our purpose in relationship with Jesus. It doesn't just do something, it gives us purpose. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, another letter, second letter to the same church. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. He loves the world that much. Despite all the sin and all the mess, he gets in there and he says, I want you back in relationship with me. I will pay the price. I will win you back. I will reconcile you back into relationship with God the Father. And you know what? When we become followers of Jesus, when we become believers, he says to us, now do the same. You have a voice of reconciliation. You have a voice to share good news of Jesus Christ who died on a cross, who paid a price, who didn't stay in the tomb but rose again to life and will return to us so that he can gather us together, so he can bring us home to Father eternally. And that eternity begins now. He gives us that good news voice. You and me these broken people that the world would define as cursed, as pointless, as broken, with bad history. No, in Christ we are ambassadors. We have value. So often we say, because of my past, I can't. Because of my past, I shouldn't. Because of all the past has made me, I'm not allowed. But in Jesus... We are redeemed by Christ. We are recreated by Christ. We are repurposed for Christ. I can't becomes I can. I shouldn't becomes I shall. That is who we are as ambassadors for Christ. Owning our reconciliation with God means we get to share that experience of reconciliation with others, his ambassadors. So don't hang on to the past. Don't hang on to the curses. Don't hang on to the history. Hang on to Jesus. You remember the sick woman that reached out and grabbed the M of Jesus' cloak? You know, sometimes all you can do, all I can do, in the midst of despair and the crowd and the noise, is just to hang on to the cloak of Jesus and think, come on, God. And I tell you what, for that woman at that moment in time, he knew her by name. He knew her. And it's the same for you and for me. He knows when you are just clinging on. We're all witnesses to something. Every one of us are witnesses to something. We are witness to our life priority. When our priorities are past, we are witnesses to anxiety and fear. When our priority is the presence of Jesus, our purpose in Christ, we are witness to his acceptance and his freedom. So let's not be a witness to our past, to anxiety, to fear, to pain. Let's be a witness to the acceptance and freedom that Christ brings. Let's reset our purpose. Let's make some practical use of this. Right, just before I close genuinely at home now, respond to this, pray, think about this through. What are you sad about? 
What are you sad about right now? What are you mad about? What are you anxious about? What are you glad about? Let me read to you from one last letter to the church. From 2 Corinthians 12. My grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses. So that Christ's power may rest on me. So whatever you're sad about, whatever you're mad about, whatever you're anxious about, you can be glad about the strength you find in Jesus. How important is that? How good is that? What the broken world may judge to be your weakness becomes God's opportunity for his glory in your life. You are valuable. Learn to live with it. I'm going to ask the band back up onto stage. And while they're coming up, I'm going to read to you these verses from 2 Peter, written 2,000 years ago. But it's still true today. But you are the ones chosen by God, chosen for the high calling of priestly work, chosen to be a holy people, God's instruments to do his work and speak out for him, to tell others of the night and day difference he made for you and from nothing to something, from rejected to accepted. So don't dare, don't dare say that you're not good enough. Don't dare say that you can't. Don't say that your experience excludes you. If you have found Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you can, you will, you should. Let's reset our lives and know who we are called to be. I know it's not easy. So just do it for this moment. And then the next moment. And on Monday morning for the Monday morning moment. And the Tuesday moment. And so on for eternity. In our troubled world, let me share this last thought with you. In Jesus, the presence of God is permanent. So remember, your trouble will pass, but God will stay. So I'm going to pray a prayer right now. If you are not a Christian, if you've never given your life to Jesus, if you don't know what it is to live in that kind of stillness and peace in the presence of God, not being defined by the people around you, but being defined by his love, pray this prayer with me. And then get in touch. Contact us so that we can support you and disciple you and encourage you and build you into a relationship with Jesus and his people. And if you are a Christian this morning and the past is just bringing anxiety and pain, Pray this prayer, it's true. Prophesy it over yourself. Declare who you are in Christ by saying amen to this. And then would you please pray for one another, put amen emojis together, clappy hands, or whatever. just let other people know that you are responding in your situation right now, that together in Christ, we are together digitally. Share what God is doing with you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I know I have done things wrong in my thoughts, words, and actions. There are so many good things I've not done. There are so many wrong things I have done. I'm sorry for those wrong things and turn from everything I know to be bad. You gave your life for me on the cross and gratefully I give my life back to you. Now I ask you to come into my life. Come in as my saviour to clean me. Come in as my Lord to lead me. and I will serve you all the remaining days of my life. Amen. So I pray the Holy Spirit fills you right now, enables you to get through these moments and to live a life well, a life defined by Jesus' love for you, not defined by a broken world. Let's celebrate and bring our worship one last time.